Having been a preacher for 41 years, it is always odd and interesting to sort of see how sermons happen. This sermon happened because in the Book of Common Prayer daily office lectionary, we have been reading Job. And when you read Job, you're immersed in what theolog theologians call questions of theodicy. Why, do, why does bad stuff happen? And I was reading Job, as the Episcopal Church has been reading Job for almost a month. And then I had two experiences as I was preparing to, uh, to engage uh, God's word in the, in the lectionary for the Holy Cross, which was the feast that was celebrated on Sunday in the two churches I visited. Because being a feast of our Lord, we felt good about bumping the common ordinary time readings. And so I, I was reading Job, and then I had two experiences. Uh, the first experience uh, was a pastoral experience, a pastoral experience of sublime trust when I called one of our priests who uh, has had a mastectomy and was getting ready for chemotherapy. And I said, what can I do to help? And she said, you could sit with me during my first chemo treatment. And as I sat with her, the theodicy questions couldn't be uh, avoided, at least in my soul and heart. Why? Why this wonderful priest with two children, wonderful husband, and an important job, and an exceptional ministry, why? Why this? And, the, and so theodicy and, and Job was banging around in my soul, and then Barbara and I watched a movie, always dangerous or frequently dangerous, a movie we had wanted to see but somehow missed in the theaters, and it was on TV, 12 Years a Slave. And watching 12 Years a Slave, the theodicy question that I was left with after enduring that movie, I don't think you enjoy it, you endure it. It is a, it is a discipline, at least I found it a discipline to watch. But the theodicy question that came to my mind after watching that for two hours was, how does any American of African descent believe in God? That was my question. And so the theodicy, why questions were banging around in my consciousness. And then I came to the text, and I, when I am lifted up, will have a magnetic capacity to draw all to myself. And I was thinking about and praying about the cross of Jesus Christ. It's so good that we have the Feast of the Holy Cross because it helps us to think about the cross again outside of the context of Holy Week. The cross. And somehow I was led to thinking about how it is that we fall into relationships. People talk about falling in love. But I think before any of us fall in love, we fall into trust. That's the first step. You know, it goes something like this. You, you're, you're, you're making a friend or you're finding a partner or a spouse and, and suddenly this relationship seems sort of important. So you start revealing a little bit of who you are and, and they start revealing a little bit of who they are and that goes okay. Then you throw out a little more stuff and they throw out a little more stuff and suddenly you have fallen into trust. One of my dearest life friends, a priest who is, who is in God's larger life now, but he was a retired priest and he worshiped in my parish and he talked about his born again experience. It had, he, and he wasn't talking about an experience with God. He was talking about his experience with his friend Joan and they were having lunch and Joe was risking revealing a piece of who he was and he had disclosed some of himself and there was a silence and he thought, oh God, I've gone too far, I've said too much. And then he said, Joan looked him in the eye and she smiled and she said, oh Joe, I've thought of all the what ifs and I love you anyway. And I, when I am lifted up, will draw. And as I think on the cross, particularly as I think on Matthew's passion and Mark's passion, the depth of it 
for me, is the sentence, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that moment, Jesus is utterly and completely and totally empty and totally Emmanuel, God with us. God with us in our gripping and grabbing and grasping questions of why. Why have you forsaken me? And, and it is almost a conversation that God is having with all of humanity. The God who has brought all into being has this profound conversation with all humanity in which God in Jesus Christ cries out our question, cries out our inner agnosticism, cries out even the atheism we are so afraid of expressing. It is as if on the cross when God says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God goes first in the conversation. God says it all. God says the worst. And in that self-emptying moment, the floodgate of conversation can open because nothing is hidden, nothing is held back. All is right there. And perhaps that God is the God that those African Americans trusted enough to say nobody knows the sorrows I feel. Nobody knows but Jesus. Jesus, who is so utterly empty and so utterly with us that he draws us into the conversation that we sometimes most are afraid to face. And so it's important to think about the cross. In fact, it's crucial to use the Latin word that's based on the word cross. It's absolutely crucial. And as we come to this Eucharist today, it is crucial that as it is always a recalling of the resurrection, it is, always, it is also always a reiteration of the crucifixion particularly as we say those haunting words over the chalice, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you. I had that much of the sermon by Sunday, and that's sort of what I preached. And then during my prayer time this morning early, about 5.30, I was reading this week's Christian Century. I was thinking about the fact that I would be at the Eucharist today. And then I just read this poem, and it arrested me. It is a powerful, to my mind and heart and ear, a powerful understanding of the reiteration of the cross and how crucial it is in every Eucharist. Her, the, the poet is Lucy Shaw, and her poem is called Bloodline. Allow me to read it. Bloodline. Consider its extravagant fertility, how dependably it breeds itself in the marrow to fill again what drains away. The rivers of blight, a bright platelet singing in their arterial dark until a simple incursion, some sharp sever, a jag, an abrupt disclosure as our secret fluid spills against its will, whether a startle or a slow seepage, a prompt to remember our fragility. When a bold splash on a lintel in Egypt signaled safety, a lifeguard against the death angel, we didn't have to die. It was only a lamb and a quick throat cut that flooded us into another life. His blood be upon us echoes in that old yell of rejection. We can yield instead 
to be washed in grace, the scandal of mercy acting as God's unlikely laundry. Today, the cup calls us to the altar rail, transfuses us as we drink deep, a stain that blots old grimes and dyes us with itself. The last line is just exquisite. Today the cup calls us to the altar rail, transfuses us as we drink deep, a stain that blots old grimes and dyes us with itself. It's very much like George Herbert's elegant couplet. Love is that liquor, sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. So in this sacred reiteration of the cross of Jesus Christ in this Eucharist, may we be dyed with himself.